Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastien Couture, and thanks so much for joining me on this very special episode all about Bitcoin marketing. So I recently attended an event called BTC2B, which was a conference happening in Brussels. Actually, it was happening in a suburb of Brussels called Uth, which is a very posh neighborhood with golf courses and country clubs and tennis courts and, and castles and things like that. So it, it was a very impressive place to have a conference. And uh, since I was invited for a panel there, and since it's only about 30 minutes away from where I live, you know, I thought, what the hey, I might as well go to this event. So the idea of this event was for it to be a Bitcoin networking event, sort of a business to business conference where entrepreneurs and investors could could meet and network and things like that. And originally I thought, like, how are they going to differentiate themselves from other conferences? Because that's really what conferences are, networking events. But when I got there, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that the whole organization was really centered around networking. You had sort of a big lobby area where people could come in and meet. And there was ample time between sessions, sort of networking sessions to mingle and have a coffee and things like that. So, you know, th th it was really well put on that way. And um, although it was a very small event, when I was there, there was only about 50 or 60 people in attendance, plus about a handful of speakers. They really managed to attract some interesting speakers, people like like Nicolas Courtois, who's a cryptographer and has some very controversial views about the security of the blockchain, and uh, Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum, of course, and Adam Vizieri, who's a lawyer and head of a company called Diacol in the UK. So it was very interesting to see those guys speak and to meet everybody there. And I want to say congratulations to the organizing committee for putting on such a great event. So this episode features two parts of the same session on Bitcoin marketing. The first part is a talk by Richard Catano, who is developing a product called Handshake, which will be coming out in the next few weeks, I believe. And we'll definitely have him on the show to talk about it when it does get released. And Richard also developed an app called BTC Report, which some of you might have used before. It's an iPhone ticker app with alerts and news and things like that and a lot of nice features and really a really beautiful ui and richard talks about the importance of sharing a story to create user engagement and he has some very interesting things to say about that the second part of this session is a panel discussion on Bitcoin marketing. It's moderated by Richard with Jeremy Gardner, who's the executive director of the College Cryptocurrency Network, which we talked about extensively in one of our recent episodes, and myself as panelists. And we talked about building products which cater to specific user needs and brings value to the regular user, to the masses. And I think it's obvious, but it's often overlooked because we lose ourselves in the technical and ideological aspects of Bitcoin. And so I think it's also important to recognize that products and marketing are part of a broader product strategy in which the user needs to be at the center always. Just think about Uber. For anyone who's used Uber, that first experience is magical. You come out of it just wanting to tell your friends how great this service is. And they've really utilized that by creating an, an ambassador model by which you can send your friends your specific uh, affiliate code and they get 10 bucks off their next ride and you get 10 bucks off your next ride. And that creates ripples and that brings more people in who also want to talk about you, Uber and use Uber. Airbnb, similar model when you come back from vacation that first time after you've used airbnb and you tell your friends you know you don't use airbnb wow you need to get on this it's so awesome you know you get to stay in these great locations with these really cool people and it's really affordable so i think we need to learn from the successes of these companies outside of the bitcoin ecosystem and recognize that if we want to get to this mass adoption which we all talk about we have to build products which appeal to the masses plain and simple so I hope you'll enjoy this episode all about Bitcoin marketing. I think it's a very important topic, and I hope we'll get to talk about it more in the future on the show. And so without further ado, here's Richard Catano. Richard here who's going to speak about marketing uh, for about 10 minutes and then we're going to have a panel discussion um, and then it'll be lunch break guys. So I'll pass over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome. 
We're going to talk a little bit about marketing within the Bitcoin space and specifically talk about some real world uh, experiences that were gained uh, through development of some, some applications. Uh, we'll look at some real product numbers and, uh, like I said, from that general marketing tips that we can use and carry it here. We can use it with our own. So, just to get familiar with the crowd, how many how many developers do we have? Okay. And how about designers? Any designers? Any designers? Okay. <laughs> and uh, how about marketing? Who's marketing? Okay. Well, um, I'm a developer. I've uh, been developing since the 1990s, worked on different kinds of systems, databases, and things like that. And then since the <clears throat> since the uh, mid-2000s, been more user-focused, developing user experience and uh, building products with that in mind. And since 2011, uh, converted a uh, Bitcoin convertee and adopted it, and changed my world, and had that great Bitcoin moment of my life, like most of you I'd imagine. Uh, so, and since that time, I've been focusing on building different kinds of apps, and in the beginning, I kind of did this shotgun approach where I took all these ideas and I just threw it against the wall and just looked at it and see what would stick. And so that involved a lot of just research and development, talking to a lot of people, testing a lot of ideas, experimenting, a lot of failures, etc. But your typical product approach where you invest a lot of R&D and you see what comes out. Um, of course, the other side of that is the marketing side, and typically, you know, you develop a product, you try to find out what market you're going to go after, and then you send the marketing folks and try and sell it and meet some numbers and things like that. However, I didn't have that luxury, so I had to, like, approach it from an agile perspective, like, what can we do with limited resources and a, a very fast-moving um, beginning space? And so what I, the approach was is to combine the two. So the product strategy was to take the product and the marketing and see how I can bring them together and work it from that perspective. And so the first point that I'd like to start with is that product and marketing has no separation. That maybe we can actually build our products with marketing already built in and not necessarily see it as two separate uh, forces within a, a rollout like that. So for a use case for this presentation, I'd like to talk about one of the apps I wrote and developed, um, well, I should say we wrote and developed, and um, give you some real world, world numbers and show you how that turned out. So the app is called BTC Report, and uh, it's a very simple app, it's a ticker. It was launched in uh, 2011, and it's been kind of on the top of the app store for, for most of that time. and. Um, been very happy with it. It's been one of those apps that when we go to conferences and talk to people, they kind of recognize it and ends up get, getting to the other kinds of discussions. Um, basically, it supports 27 currencies, 35 different marketplaces, just a very simple app. Um, but we ended up having 40,000 downloads. Um, we didn't expect that. We have no marketing budget. And so looking back, we wanted to pull out what were the lessons learned and the experiences that uh, could be useful going forward. And so if you look at some interesting data, this is what the, the download chart looks like. You know, we've got these twin peaks here, and we're like, okay, this is interesting. This is really cool. It's very exciting times. And it, it looks even more interesting when you overlay the Bitcoin price. <laughs> so you can see that, like, when people get excited about Bitcoin, they start looking at what's available on the, in the market space, you know, what kind of apps can they use, what kind of... Uh, Tools can they work with? Uh, people just start exploring. So there's definitely some opportunity when things start shaking in the Bitcoin world, indicated by the price in this case. And so, of course, I mean, we're at the beginning of the Bitcoin revolution. We all kind of know that. And in that respect, what can we, um, how can we position like our marketing strategy? What can we think about um, to make a better use and efficient uh, rollout of our products? So, um, I've simplified an adoption curve here. Um, basically, I broke down a bell curve looking at early adopters, mainstream, and the laggards, and really, we're at the beginning. And so, looking at this curve, we can kind of get an idea of who we're, who we're working with um, and what kind of messaging we wanted to use within our applications. 
uh, our marketing materials, our app store descriptions, and things like that. And so if you look at the first two types of, uh, of adoptees, you have the early adopters who are mostly driven by the like, cool effect. You know, There's a scarcity, like, oh, I'm the only one using this. Nobody really has this yet. I'm ahead of the curve. Um, and so they're driven by things that may like <clears throat> sound more like, um, you know, it's cool and hip to be a part of this. Whereas the mainstream might have a different, um, like, they might respond differently to the messaging, where they might be more like, well, my friend's using this, so I want to be part of that. Um, so I would say, like, right now, we can, in our messaging, in our approach to marketing, we can say, well, let's target the early adopters, because that's who's using it right now. And so they're turned on more by scarcity. They, they, want to, um, they want to have things that others don't have or don't know about. Um, some of the messaging can be like, be one of the first to have this. Um, for a BTC report, we, we used the, the, the message in the beginning, join the crypto revolution. That was kind of our thing. Um, but as I said, eventually, and we don't know how soon this could happen, we should start preparing for the mainstream, which we would change the messaging. More about you know joining the group, uh, being more interactive with your your friends and peers. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is one of the features that we built into the app that helps to engage the user base more um, more into the app. And we you know most apps today have the typical sharing features where you can tweet and email things, but we took that. And we spun it around with a little bit more of a marketing approach. Um, we can share the story. And that was one of the things that we talked about building this app around, is telling the Bitcoin story from a very like user-friendly and uh, simple way. And so what we actually did is just, we just take the app and we just include a screenshot of it with the chart. Because it's just valuable information, we thought, and we could just share it. And what we found was we had a great response. People would tweet the chart and provide some commentary. And suddenly we, we realized that they're all telling the story. It's all part of the story. And so uh, this is an example of combining product and marketing together. Um, this is just one idea, but you can explore other ways of doing that as well. Um, telling stories seems to be something that people connect to very well. So it's, it's been a, kind of a main theme for our approach. So a great takeaway from here is just encourage sharing and try to develop that within the team. Um, as far as numbers go, we kind of stumbled on something that was interesting. More than half of our users open the app more than once a day. And so what we found was this is a high, use, high usage of the app. I mean, if we think about how I use my iPhone, it's the SMS I open multiple times a day. It's uh, maybe the browser, my email client, Twitter, and BTC report. It's kind of weird. So we felt responsible to, um, to not make uh, ticker junkies out of, our, <laughs> out of our users. And what that means is we didn't want people to be constantly like, obsessed with this data, obsessed with the app. And so what we did is, um, this is actually the second revision to our design. The first, the first revision, or the first design was more of like your traditional stock ticker mm -hmm. app where a lot of information was included. But for the second design, we actually simplified it. We took a lot of information out and um, focus more on the essentials. And additionally, we, early on, we provided meaningful interaction points such as price alerts so that people weren't always like, going back to the app. And the, uh, our motivation was to promote good, good behavior with our applications and not to create the, the chicken junkie. And so eventually, I mean, what we're trying to do is really create happy users because the more happy they are using our app and the less disruptive it is to their lives, the more they would promote our app. And so as far as combining product and marketing, again, <clears throat> we're trying to leverage our users' interaction and, um, and have them share. And that's what we found. A lot of people were always like, showing the app to their friends. Um, so it's a really short presentation, but to review the opportunities, um, think about the product strategy, how we can combine product and marketing together. Um, Mind the adoption curve, know where you're at, know who you're speaking with, know where it's going. There's several different levels in that curve that we can dive into further. Um, enrich your users' world. So the more happy we make our users, the more they're going to tell other people about it. And that's the best marketing you can ever do, I, I believe. Uh, good design is really important. Um, the high correlation to like good design and 
increase engagement with, uh, with the product. And most importantly, um, try to build good impressions, leave your users with good impressions of your product, because that will go a long way. So, thank you. Any questions? I love your app. I, I love it. It's, it's, oh. it's, it's great. I wonder, Thank you. Uh, I tried to, uh, I do a little bit of mobile, and I was wondering uh, how did you settle on the text that people are supposed to tweet, and how many people did actually tweet? Um, because it's always hard, you know, what do you suggest people tweet? What, what, so going what back to message, this right? screen right here? Yeah, yeah. So how, how do you decide that you should just tweet this, not, not anything more? I guess in your case it might, be, it might have been obvious, right? But yeah, so for the default, uh, for the default message, yeah. we wanted to create a hashtag for the exchange. Because a, a, a lot of what we're trying to do here, the work we're trying to do is promote the exchanges. All right. So Coinbase USD is the hashtag that we would create from the exchange. Of course, the prize. And then, yeah, BTC report, right. yeah. Like yeah. Right. Right. But we try to like make it, you know, where people can tell the story from their perspective and what's going on. Can you share the numbers of how many people actually share, use the functionality? Or was it just those four? Um, yeah, I don't have the numbers, but we can, you can definitely search on, oh yeah, there's, <laughs> that would be misleading, right? <laughs> But uh, yeah, you can do a search for BTC Report, at BTC Report on Twitter, and you can see. Yeah. I just pulled like some, the four I pulled were kind of interesting. You know, price still wobbly, but we're gun ho. A few spikes before another run, rallying hard. I, want, I wanted to drop more in order to get it again. Like, these are all just great points, I thought. So I use these as examples. And do you have any plans for, uh, for other kinds of marketing? Or are you just hoping for the next spike? Or is there an marketing that you plan to do? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we kind of feel that there's a spike coming, so we've been doing some work, yeah, to get ready for it. Um, a lot of people are asking us, is this available on Android, you know, other, other devices? And so as an, this kind of started as an experiment, and we're in this really weird, like, gray area where we either need to, like, invest more into it, or we need to sell it to someone who, who will do that. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we don't know which way we're going to go yet. We've got other projects that we're focusing on, so... Um, yeah, that's... And you're not earning money on that, right? Aside from promoting one or two... Yeah, so the, so the strategy for that was all information on the app should be free. And if you pay for anything, it's just for enhancements. All right, then you have a Yeah, so if you... Yeah, so like we offer like colors and you know just kind of things that make people happy. You know, if you want to buy that. So. Uh, but yeah, all information from the beginning was always free. So um, maybe we can start with the introduction. I know that you just recently did that just a couple hours ago. So for those of you who are not my speech, my name is Jeremy Gardner, and I'm the executive director of the College Cryptocurrency Network. We're an international network of uh, student groups and academics dedicated to blockchain, innovation, advocacy, and development. Uh, I am Sebastian Puccio. I am a podcaster. I am one of the co-hosts of Epicenter Bitcoin, or a weekly podcast where we interview some of the brightest minds in uh, the decentralization and cryptocurrency space. And uh, we're going to record our 50th episode in a few weeks. Nice. And we're now doing Google Hangouts, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> so you can come on and, and, uh, and interact with the guests uh, through a chat room. And, uh, and it's creating some really interesting conversations. Great. <clears throat> so we have, uh, so we're down some questions that we can talk about. Um, the first one is, um, so when we look at the early adopters of Bitcoin, we find a wide range that spans from crypto anarchist geeks all the way to mom and pop business owners. And so what would be some perspectives that we can use to engage with this uh, wide range and how would, how would we approach this? Well, to the early adopters, I mean, all those folks, they, they tend to adopt Bitcoin not because it's a great consumer-facing or merchant technology, but really because for ideological reason, reasons. Although the mom-and-pop shops actually do see the merchant advantages. But what we have to do now, though, is now that we have this technology that makes a lot of sense to people, is building a, an ecosystem around it that facilitates ease of use. Uh, one of my other 
startups along with the nonprofit is actually a point of sale system. And that point of sale system isn't just for Bitcoin. It makes Bitcoin transactions incredibly easy. It uses Bluetooth low energy, lets you do pretty much just open up your wallet and make a payment just by having a, a, a point of sale terminal nearby. It also lets you use NFC and QR. But what we also do, because you want, you want to make this as simple for the merchants as possible, we also accept NFC payments. So Apple Pay, uh, 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 Google Wallet, and then credit cards, so EMV and Swipe. In that way, you've kind of got these tri trifecta of technologies. You don't have to use them all. You can just use it for Bitcoin. The, the device costs us $100, and there's really nothing to lose. You're, you know, you're getting all the, the gains of Bitcoin without the pain of like using a QR, because I don't know how many people here try going into a business and paying with Bitcoin right now, and it's a nightmare. It doesn't work in a very straightforward manner um, in store, and you, you've got to go over that hump in order for any hope of everyone sort of starting to begin to adopt. What do you find as some of the resistance points in getting that deployed, in getting that into the stores? Verifone. I mean, you're talking yeah. about an entrenched point-of-sale terminal monopoly. Mm. Um, you know, we actually had a bunch of people in the Bitcoin space offer us a lot of money. For a while, we were going to go into a tech accelerator, or, and then for a little while, we were actually did, uh, in, in negotiations with PayPal, talking about doing an acquisition. But, you know, PayPal's kind of evil. i um, not a huge <laughs> fan of the company. Uh, both my developer and I, this kid's a genius, um, we, we also have another project that we're working on that's funded, and so we decided that what we're going to do is we're going to build this product out, um, we're going to market it um, more as a Bitcoin point-of-sale terminal because that is the biggest pain point, that's what drove us to make it, and then we'll, we'll then send it out to Bitcoin mer accepting merchants, test it, and then see if we can gain adoption. But the thing is, is that people are very comfortable with the terminals they use now. Um, what you have to show them, and this is what we need, is uh, use cases. And show them this is easier, this is cheaper, and this is better. Um, also, I mean, if you want to do a large-scale implementation, you're talking about manufacturing millions of devices. There are 6.5 million in-store uh, consumer retailers in the United States. So it's a massive market you have to tap into. And just even knowing where to start can be very difficult. If I could just add a uh, new question. I think that... There's, there's a, a difference in incentive for the crypto anarchist and the merchant also. So you have to align. Yeah, very true. So you have to align the, I guess, the incentive and the value add for you know, different people that you're targeting. So whether you're targeting a mom and pop store, like you said, you have to try to find ways to solve some of the issues that they have, which is high cost of operating a, a payment card terminal, for instance, or consumers. So you have to find ways to uh, be able to solve some of the problems that they're having with pain in, uh, in stores. So um, recognizing the different pain points that different people in this chain have uh, is key to producing, creating products that will appeal to them. Uh, I think we'll probably get to talk about that more in this panel. Yeah. Um, but that's, I think, one of the key things that needs to be identified before you can start making products and trying to target different people. Just, just to add on to that, um, don't worry about marketing to the crypto anarchists and to the libertarians. They've already latched on, and if they haven't, the second they discover Bitcoin, they will latch on because it, it's right in line with their I ideals. The, 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 real, the real challenge is marketing the, this to individuals that ideologically may not be in line with those sort of values, but still have a tremendous amount of value from this technology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, along the same lines, you know, BTC is, to some, to many actually, is still considered this mysterious, magical money, this internet money. Um, so a big question, I, or a big question we could present is how, what are some ways that we can better educate the people? Um, explaining what it is, but not necessarily like in a technological perspective, but more like how can this help you? How can this help us? You know, we have these messages where we say, oh, you know, uh, Bitcoin's not bombs, you know, things right. like that. Like, really, these are massive changes to how society functions. And that's a hard message to get across. I don't think, when it comes down to it, I think, so education is important, obviously, and you know, some of the things that you're doing is great, and you know, I also run yeah. a meetup, and you know, I think that having, sorry, having a, a, 
a venue where people can come and, and learn about Bitcoin, uh, the technology is, is, is great. I think that if we're going to kind of reach this mass adoption, you know, which you talked about in your, in your talk, um, educating people about Bitcoin and technology is not necessarily where we need to be focusing our energy. It's <laughs> illustrating how the technology can uh, solve some of these pain points that they're having, really extracting the technology from the whole thing. Right? We want to build products. Um, just look at, we can look at some, some examples. Uh, when you take an Uber, you don't care you know, what service you're using or if you have to use a taxi or whatnot, although you may have some, um, you may be somewhat adverse to using a taxi because you've had bad experience or what have you. If you're using Uber, it's because you've heard good things and you've mm -hmm. had good experiences with them and, and you kind of become like an ambassador. I mean, when, when I first used Uber, I mean, the first thing I did afterwards is tell my friends about how great it was and how I use it all the time. And, and I, I use my, my um, referral code to get free rides to my friends, right? I think this is the type of thing that we need to try to move towards is letting the users be ambassadors. They're not the technology, but the products that are mm. built on top of the technology. And of course, we need to make that you know, those products easy to use and accessible and, and for, for people to get into the, to the ecosystem. Um, but uh, talking about the technology to your mom and pop store or to your college kid or whoever is, is not what we need to be focused on. Our energies. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, ab absolutely. I mean, my, my life these days is really explaining Bitcoin to people. And it's something I can do now, but it's something I don't want to have to do. I was in Orlando at Coins in the Kingdom, and this was a cryptocurrency conference at Disney World. And I kept on taking Ubers, actually. It's great, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it was an awesome little event. Uh, but I, I kept on having these uh, Uber drives with these Haitian taxi drivers or, or Uber drivers. And I was explaining Bitcoin to them. And they were like, oh, my God, this is going to change my life. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But the problem was there wasn't an app I could direct them to that will allow them to remit money back home. Mm. And so when I'm explaining Bitcoin to people, I don't want to explain the underlying technology and what a blockchain is and a 10-minute cab drive with a Haitian taxi driver. I want to I send them to an application that lets them send money over the blockchain to their family back home easily. I'm not, I'm not really concerned about how the actual technology works because they're not going to start hacking away at, and developing a program on top of it. I mean, no offense to the Haitian taxi drivers, it's just... Is not within the realm of what they do, but what what I think is important though <coughs> is communicating what the blockchain is to certain demographics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about identifying your audience for the College Cryptocurrency Network. I mean, we're hosting hackathons on every on four no on four continents next month, and we're we're going to ones in like Argentina and Buenos Aires, and there are three thousand to four thousand people hackathons. It's pretty much an entire nation of hackers all come together for one hackathon, and we're bringing Bitcoin to it. We're bringing Bitcoin uh, companies into this space. And those are the guys that you want to learn how, what Bitcoin is and how it works, because they're the guys that are going to build the applications that change the lives of people in their countries. You know, we have a hackathon in Kenya, and you want hackers there learning what Bitcoin and the blockchain are, because they can really benefit from it. Mm. But I don't think we need to worry so much about talking to consumers about this technology. Obviously, People like you and I, I mean, we, we have to talk about this because it's our jobs. But it should, it should, that shouldn't be the end goal. The end goal should be having applications that speak for the technology and, and say, look at what you can do with this awesome app. You can t say, oh, by the way, use this Bitcoin. But uh, we will never reach mainstream adoption until people don't knew, know that they're using the technology. The example of remittance is great. I mean, this really illustrates... Uh, where we need to kind of close that gap between the technology and the usage, mm. right, is the story. Mm. So sharing the story, like you mentioned a while ago, that when you share the story, you create an ambassador, which is then mm. you know, talk about that product, and, you know, so that Asian taxi driver is going to tell his Asian taxi driver friend, hey, by the way, I just sent money to my family, it didn't cost me a thing, it took five minutes. Right. So, and that's a $550 billion dollar industry, right. extortionate right. industry that has no need to exist anymore in the Bitco with Bitcoin, yet... It's still, there are just no good killer apps for that. Because, you know, when you're trying to introduce someone to this tech, I actually told all these Asian taxi drivers, I was like, 
look up Bitcoin now. They all just say, I mean, they love the idea. But don't plan to use it for a few months. Like, just <laughs> well, wait until there's some good applications for you to use this. Because what happens is, and I've seen this, and I, I just recently moved to San Francisco. There are probably 300 stores, in stores, that, that, that once accepted Bitcoin. There are now, like, 60 left. Because it's not an intuitive in-store process. You don't want to introduce people to technology and tell them to use it before the applications are built for them to be ready to use it. That's why we built this point of sale system. That's why there are several companies that are really trying to figure out remittances that are getting very close. But uh, yeah, when I when I pitch Bitcoin, I, I talk more about what I'm doing and how it's going to affect people. I don't tell people to go use it right now or go buy it right now because at the end of the day, I'm not really sure that's really going to benefit them. And I want this technology to benefit people. So right. it, it's figuring right. out that. Right. In a lot of ways, you can compare it. I like to compare it when speaking with people about Bitcoin. Uh, comparing it to email in 1992, email is a protocol. In 1992, we logged into a console and we wrote some commands and we sent email. Today, we open our iPhone, put a password, and username and password, and we have email. And so the concept of what an email is today is much different than what it was back then. In the same regards, Bitcoin is a protocol. And the apps that, that people identify with don't exist. Or they do in very underdeveloped ways. So I think it's a really good point to mention that, you know, where, where we're going is what we can talk about, not necessarily what you can do now, because we just, we're still develop, underdeveloped. Right. It's ways. like the advent of the fax machine, you know. The first fax machine came out, it was a great idea, it's like, wow, you can send documents anywhere instantly, but oh wait, nobody else has a fax machine. <laughs> you, can't really, you can't really use it yet. Uh, so it, it, but it's about finding the initial adopters, which is where we're getting to. I don't think we've even fully uh, finished getting the initial adopters. And then it's building those applications and making those applications prevalent. And then, then everything begins to flourish. But, it, but it's a systematic process, yeah. although it might seem kind of anarchical, which it is. Yeah. Um, often, when I speak to people about Bitcoin, the issue of drugs, money laundering, criminal activity, all the bad press comes to mind, all the questions come out. Um, in terms of marketing our applications and working with people, what, um, how can we overcome this? Is there anything that we can do to help Positive experiences. Positive experiences. Positive reinforcement. We were discussing this this morning, though I'm old enough to remember the internet mid-1990s and being a young teenager and, and hearing my, you know, telling my parents and grandparents about you know, the internet and you know, how I used it. And, oh yeah, I chatted with this person you know, outside the world and, oh, but you need to be careful because I heard this thing in the news that you know, some kid got abducted or you know, some kid went to meet this person they thought was a kid and was in fact an, an old bit of all. Um, so through, you know, that still exists, but that's not the first thing that comes to mind now when, when we talk about the internet or, you know, the World Wide Web. And how did that change? Well, through positive experiences and one, at some point, you know, the positive experiences and the good things that we have to say about the technology kind of overcome the bad things. And, uh, and that becomes what, what's, you know, uh, front of mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of French, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that becomes you know the things you think about, right? You think about, oh yeah, well, my friend did this thing, and so uh, they had a positive experience, and that other stuff kind of falls to the wayside. So I think uh, having good stories to tell, again, coming back to your analogy of sharing the story, will help to kind of. But you, you know, it's all propaganda, right? You know, the, the drugs and the trafficking and, and the money laundering is propaganda. From once the media starts wisening up to uh, how this technology is beneficial and their corporate um, advertisers also do, I think their discourse will probably change. I don't yeah, I mean, there, there's a hilarious editorial from 1994 and 1996 which was published in the New York Times by the editorial board talking about how the internet was this wild west for the black market and how it was fueling all this illegal activity and, you know, hindsight. Who, who, who now says, oh, the Internet's just used for bad things? Like, obviously, it has a lot more applications than that. Bitcoin's the exact same way. Um, the difference is, however, that Bitcoin is, in terms of, like, real bad things in the world, if we talk about the real systems plaguing society, it's like the lack of transparency in finance. It's the big banks having too much power, not knowing where their money is going. 
It's not knowing where political campaigns or, uh, contributions are coming from. Super PACs. Like, these things are terrible. And guess what? Bitcoin actually solves that. Bitcoin, in fact, is the most transparent financial technology created in human history. It is, the blockchain is a distributed, gigantic public ledger of every transaction that's ever occurred. Now, if you think about that for a moment, yes, it's going to make it difficult when someone's si- selling a dime bag of weed to their friend. I don't know if that's the right slang in, over here, but <laughs> sell, 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 selling a small amount of drugs to someone, yes, it benefits them. It can be anonymous. You know, no one's ever going to track that. But when HSBC wants to go and launder money for Mexican drug cartels or terrorists, as they've been found to have done in the past and who knows what other banks, when they're trying to launder $10 million over the blockchain, everyone's going to see that. that that's transparency. That's financial accountability. Um, you know, there are things like Dark Wallet and Coin Scramblers, and those, those actually aren't proven to work very well. And, you know, there are coins like Dark Coin that actually are very anonymous, and those are concerns. But Bitcoin, and this is what you have to highlight because this is what most people use, is the most transparent financial technology that's ever existed. This is what I tell people because I come from a very liberal background. Dad's an academic. My, I think the city I was born in is called the most liberal city in America. And, you know, that's, that, that's a very unique perspective in Bitcoin. It's a lot of techno-libertarian, anarcho-capitalists. And so the message that's been conveyed is not just that, okay, sure, you can buy drugs off the Internet. Most of the, most of the people in this space is like, oh, I don't care. Like, that's good. That's a free market. Like, who, who cares? But if you want a market to everyone, you have, you have to appeal to a different rationale. And that rationale is, is that the blockchain is actually a good thing. And that the more we adopt it, and the more we put it into our financial system, the more society benefits. Because yes, on a small level, it, it creates personal financial freedom, which I'm not opposed to. Like, if someone wants to sell a bag of weed, fine. But if you want to launder money for drug cartels, people should be able to see that. And that's what the blockchain affords. That's a very good point. Yeah. Um, kind of switching gears here a little bit. Um, so as, we're, as, we, uh, as we see in today's world, a lot of marketing is done through social networking and different online services. And there's a lot of this share and share. You know, I share what I've just done. I've shared how many miles I ran. You know, all this kind of information that we, we, um, we find it coming up. From a financial perspective... How can we engage in similar ways, but also respect the privacy and the sensitivity of the data that we're working with? Maybe it's a little bit more difficult of a question, isn't it? Well, when you talk about sharing, sharing the stories or using social media to share experiences, there's probably different ways that we can, we can do that. Um, so when we think about merchant transactions, uh, I just saved so much on this transaction because... Mm-hmm. I use Bitcoin, I didn't use my credit card, so therefore I didn't have to pay fees. That could be one way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If anybody in the audience has any ideas, I'd love to hear <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is not so much about like sharing as being your own bank. It's the idea that you can now have Venmo without a two days to withdraw money mm-hmm. or three days to withdraw mm-hmm. money. This can be an incredibly social experience. Because I can have my wallet on my phone, my friend can have his wallet on his phone, and just you wait, uh, uh, m- my developer, we're working with the guys from Airbits to put out a BIP for BLE wallets, and all of your wallets soon will have this. Bluetooth Low Energy is amazing. I can say, uh, our, our dinner tab, I, I, I paid with my credit card, and my, our dinner tab was $140. I can split it eight ways, and each of my friends at the dinner table, without moving, can pay can pay my phone immediately. It's, it's a game changer, and I have that money instantly. It's Bitcoin, but it's money, you know. And uh, that that's huge. It's the idea that you can send money instantly. And I think that's sharing inherently. It's the instantaneous nature of the technology. Along those same lines, how, do you, how would you see ourselves um, marketing ourselves, or I should say the Bitcoin community, um, in relation to traditional banking services? I mean, I know there's, there's many advantages and cost savings and instant payments and such, but there's also this, you know, uh, the banking industry is not a very um, popular industry. I think there's been some stats published showing how unpopular the industry actually is. Um, 
do we want to? I mean, do we want to kind of absorb into that, or we want to really break away from from the traditional? Um... So, so for a hundred years, two hundred years, actually, all of human history, really, the average Joe never had an opportunity to create any sort of innovation within the financial services industry. It just wasn't possible. Maybe the super brilliant guys came up with all new systems, but I'm not aware of them. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto released his white paper. All of a sudden, people had a tool, just code, lines of code, math. It wasn't a system. It wasn't a set of laws. It was pure mathematics that worked that allowed people to be their own banks and to build their own financial technology. Um, so that inherently threatens an entrenched institution like banks, but we have to recognize that they still have a role in the world. Now, they may not be the banks of today, but you still need people that are providing loans. You still need institutions that protect people's life savings. You know, those institutions are going to continue to exist. So what I think is really important is that we don't antagonize the banks, well, as little as we're going to, people like Jamie uh, Morgan, at, uh, J uh, Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, are inherently threatened and just dislike Bitcoin. But if you look at some of the other banks, they're taking more intuitive, intelligent approaches to the technology. My greatest concern is that federal regulators are actually going to make it so that banks end up using their own blockchain so that, that that transparency I was talking about before won't exist. The best thing we can do is to have a system in which everyone's using Bitcoin where there is a blockchain system where there's transparency. I mean, the banks don't like that, and that's what threatens them most. It's not well, that makes an interesting marketing point. Right. I mean, blockchain should be public. I right. Mean, I don't think you would trust a blockchain that's private. Right. But it will still benefit a bank. Yeah. So what we have to do is have a system where they're expect. I mean, in my ideal world, and now this will appall maybe half the people in the room, and it definitely appalls people at most conferences, and is that if the Fed adopted a cryptocurrency and adopted a blockchain, because then all of a sudden you eliminate volatility, you have a system that's completely transparent, and it's a system that everyone uses. That that would be revolutionary. I mean, I know that the Fed's thinking about it. Um, we have a couple of advisors from the Fed, including the vice president of uh, the St. Louis Fed, and you can look up his presentation on Bitcoin. He loves it. I mean, I think it would be a dangerous thing, sort of. I mean, some of those individual liberties that Bitcoin now affords uh, would be lost. But at the same time, you would have a transparent global financial system. And to me, that's the greatest possible thing you could ask for. I'd like to see a world in which... I, I think we'd all like to see this world in which the, the financial institution, the banks, are completely disrupted by by Bitcoin and don't know how to react to it. Much like the taxis are now, much like they have in taxis and and, uh, and and hotels, you know, they're all up in arms about about these new uh, these new startups coming into the market and just completely disrupting them. Um, I'd like to see all of these regulated. I think I'm on battery. All right. So I'd like to see all of these regulated uh, professions and, and industries be completely. Uh, disrupted and not, have no, not know how to react. And the smart ones will. The smart ones will react and adjust their business model to uh, and see far enough ahead in the future to, to know that this is not the time. Uh, these are not old times. You know, these are new times, and they, they need to adapt to that in order to survive. And the ones that don't won't, and they'll die off hopefully. And we'll have you know new companies coming in with a vision that is you know, uh, focused on the future and where things are going and you know, not trying to hold back uh, their existing uh, business models, uh, which are corrupt and you know, all these bad things that we can say about the financial market. Uh, just to come back to what we were talking sure. about just earlier, um, I think that within, so, so with regards to the question about drug cartels and, and money laundering, there's lots of hypocrisy and Very true. the discourse that, okay, uh, Bitcoin can be used for money laundering and drugs and things like that, when in fact, like you mentioned, the banks are all, uh, doing, the they're all, doing, they're all right. doing the same thing. So um, once that also becomes apparent to people, and I think young people especially, uh, mm -hmm. and the types of people that are involved in college crypto, like you say, no, not old enough to be in the old system, but <coughs> not young enough to, to, uh, not, to not be involved and not think that they have some, some say and some power to change things. Um, yeah, once those people become wise to, uh, and they are, uh, to the reality of, of our world, uh, they'll build things that will completely disrupt existing uh, you, industries. You, you gotta help, you gotta get to them while they're still hopeful, you know. 
My parents, my, 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 I mean, no, it's true though. I mean, I, I talk to my parents who are very intelligent individuals, but they just can't imagine a world with Bitcoin because it's so different from what they know. And you have, you have to be speaking to people that can ma- imagine a world without the big banks. And for our generation, it's just so easy to do because we, we hate them, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but but don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, the Goldman Sachs is called the vampire squid because it's got its tentacles everywhere. We're trying to chop off some of those tentacles, but some of them are always going to exist. And we, and we can't be so hopeful. I think companies like J.P. Morgan, that's questionable because they're taking an approach that, that's saying, oh, screw Bitcoin, we're going to compete against it. So don't compete with it. Adopt it. Be smart about it. And companies like Bol- Goldman Sachs, in fact, are really thinking about that. Uh, it, I'll even give you an anecdote. My aunt was the first vi- uh, female vice president of a national bank. She was over at uh, Citibank. And... When I told her I got into her Bitcoin, she, I mean, she reads Wall Street Journal front to back every day. And she came back to me a couple months later, and she was like, Jeremy, you'll be damned if you don't think every single big bank is figuring out how to adopt this technology right now. Um, and I, I think some of them might be dumb enough not to, arrogant enough not to, but the smart guys, the smartest guys in the room, they're all thinking about this. They're all, if they're not thinking about Bitcoin, they're thinking about the blockchain. Um, you, you know, banks are not taxi drivers. Um, the, I mean, not to discredit taxi drivers. Like I said, awesome Haitian taxi drivers over the weekend. I love my Uber guys. But you're talking about some of the smartest people in the world working at these banks, believe it or not. Um, and so they're, they're thinking about this technology, and it's just whether they will adopt fast enough to keep up with the coin basis to circle blockchain to the world. So I hope you enjoyed this session on Bitcoin marketing from BTC2B in Brussels. I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you want to support the show, there are multiple ways you can do that. You can start by leaving us a review on iTunes. That greatly helps us in attracting new listeners. And you can also leave us a tip at epicenterbitcoin.com slash tips. More and more of you have been signing up for that $5 a month donation, and we greatly appreciate your support. You can follow us on Twitter at EpicenterBTC. That's where we release new episodes, feature content, news, and where we announce upcoming Google Hangouts. That's right. We're doing Google Hangouts now. Didn't you know? You can watch live uh, as we interview guests and interact with them in the Q&A module. So you can actually ask your questions live on the show and have be featured on the show. So more and more of you have also been uh, joining us for the live Hangouts. And it's been really a great experience. We're also on Facebook, Google+. Plus. Our, our Hangouts are also on our events page on, on the Google Plus page. And finally, uh, sign up for the newsletter at Epicenter Bay. Bitcoin.com slash newsletter. Brian sends that out every Friday, and it's a great way to stay up to date on the latest uh, Bitcoin news. So thanks again for listening, and we look forward to being back on the next episode.